Hello, everybody, and welcome to this spoiler review episode for episode three of The Last of Us from The Geek Buddies. <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, God. What episode we have ahead of us today. Long, long time. Episode three, directed by Peter Hoare. Um, what an incredible episode. We're going to break it all down here for you guys and uh, uh, talk about everything that happened here in one of, just right off the bat, let me just say, one of the most incredible episodes of television I've ever seen. Uh, and I've lived a long time, so you know I'm saying something there. But we're going to break it all down here as the Geek Buddies. So thank you very much for joining us. Let's introduce ourselves first. I am the outlaw John Rocco, writer, producer, and host here on the Geek Buddies. I am Michael Vogel. I'm a writer and producer of animated TV shows and movies. And this is Shannon McClung. I'm an animation writer and a television actor where you're going to get to see me in this February on the season premiere of Party Down. And also, I can tell you guys this, I'm pinned for a nice little episode of another TV show. Oh. So, oh. fingers crossed. Maybe Everybody I'll cross celebrate your fingers. In the middle. Everybody cross your fingers for McClung. Absolutely. Maybe I'll celebrate in the middle of this. Maybe I'll start crying for a whole together different reason. <laughs> That's good. I like that. I like that. And of course, we are powered and sponsored by the great folks over at Carbon Health. Go and get uh, checked out today if you've got any health care questions, concerns, or needs. They've got virtual care, in-person care, all of it available for you. 100 plus locations all over, Cal all over the states, rather. 80 plus locations in California alone. If you don't want to go, uh, you know, go on the web or whatever, then just download the app. If you like doing that, live in the app life, go and download the app for Carbon Health and find a place. Maybe i um, uh... Maybe things would have been a little bit different for Bill and Frank if they had had COVID, carbon health. Well, you know, like Frank said, you know, this stuff couldn't be cured before the pandemic. How would it be cured after? So, yeah, anyway, but yes, please go get checked out at Carbon Health. The way we're going to jump into this thing, we're going to break it into sections. This is a spoiler review. So if you have not seen the episode, especially this episode, we cannot encourage you enough to go and watch it first and then come back and hang out with us. Michael, we got to start with you. And I think for, for many reasons, we got to start with you. What did you think of this episode overall here? Long, long time from The Last of Us. Well, I agree with you that I think it maybe is one of the best hours of television I've seen in quite some time. And a lot of you are probably thinking that I think that just because I'm gay. And you are correct. <laughs> I think that because I am gay and this was a fucking amazing story of some gay romance in a way that I had never seen it before on TV and it was beautiful and it was touching and it was very different from the game, um, which is really, really interesting. And I think that, you know, there's I've seen some debate about whether um, making the changes they did was good and bad by making yeah. both of them, again, spoiler review, having both of them uh, passed away by the time that Joel and Ellie get there, people were feeling, well, then what was the point? What was it necessary? I think it was great. I think it was yeah. beautiful. I think it actually underscored a lot of the themes that are going on with Joel and Ellie and with the game as a, as a a on the whole. And really, it was just one of those magical hours of television. You know, I was unprepared. Like, I knew... A little bit um, from having played parts of the game and kind of knowing what happens in the game. I knew a little bit of what we were going to get, but I don't think yeah. anybody was expecting to get fully what we got in this episode. Uh, and I was unprepared. And then I went to Twitter and was happy to find out that most of the world was equally as unprepared as I was. Uh, and it's always fun when you have an episode like this, that when you do go to social media afterwards, yeah. everybody kind of shares in that experience of like, holy shit, what the hell just happened? I'm a broken mess. And yeah. that is where I was last evening. Okay. Shannon McClung, your thoughts on this uh, episode that uh, we got from The Last of Us? I mean, I would agree. Like, this this is one of the better hours of television in, I mean, you could say ever. I mean, this was just so incredibly well done. Um, the changes, because I also, I, in general, I don't look up a whole lot about the game because the, mm -hmm. I am going in so blind to this. This was something I looked up afterwards because I, I, I wanted to see what Frank had. I'm like, I think this is Parkinson's, um, but but I just awesome. I just want to check. Yeah. And then I found out how much had actually changed. Yeah. And I think one of the things I think where Walking Dead kind of started to go off the tracks a little bit is there was just zero hope. It was almost like torture porn. Like, what yeah. else can we put these people through? And I feel like when you have a character in Joel's situation who is coming off the loss of Tess, who 
whose status they elevated in terms of his relationship. I guess in the game, she's she's they know each other, but it, mm-hmm. it's never really uh, um, specifically laid out that they're romantic partners. And even in this, that's still a little fuzzy. Like you know, we're getting it. Like yeah, they were they were involved, but to sort of um, remind Joel of his failure, one with his daughter, now with Tess. But you see, it's not a light at the end of the tunnel, but you see how in this dark, dark world, there are still those moments of light and how Bill and Frank found each other. And just the performances of Nick Offerman and Murray Bartlett were just so, so good. And it, yeah, I mean, this was, I, I had heard going in, zero context that this that this might be the best episode of the season Ooh, wow. um, and, and thus far and that's that's no shade on one or two because i thought one and two were fantastic but this one this one was really it was really something else like really really enjoyed it what's the mantra i always say give time to these other characters in your show to flesh them out because they will be an effective much more satisfying overall show that being said, this was just brilliant stuff from Craig Mazin and Neil Druckmann, especially Neil Druckmann, because, you know, he said very clearly, we might not go forward with the show uh, if we don't have the material source or the material to use as the foundation. We don't want to pull a Game of Thrones. Well, this episode essentially kind of counters that because almost everything in here is not in the game. There are certain things that are connected to the game with Bill and Frank. Frank has gone off. Bill doesn't know where Frank is. Frank, we find Frank in the game. You find Frank, and you, I don't want to ruin that for people who haven't seen the game, but things happen, and you find the note and all of that. So it's part of the game, but the, what they did here was flesh out this story in a way to make a commentary about how you need to have hope, you need to have love, what you do for love. And I think that final letter uh, when he says to him, like, I didn't care about it. if anybody died. I didn't care that the whole world died. But I met someone that I did want to keep alive. I met someone I wanted to protect. I met someone I wanted to live for. And that was really powerful. And I think connecting, as Janet just said, to where Joel is right now with having lost Tess and now having to take care of Ellie and going after his brother, there's a lot going on with his natural instincts. Um, And I thought the show did a beautiful job of not um, shirking it, not giving you just cursory implications you know, like some other studios like to do with their gay romances in their in their shows or in their TV or in their uh, movies, they fully dove into it. You know exactly what this was and what they were talking about, and it was a beautiful love story. And I think they did a better job with this story for this context of the show than they did for the game, in my opinion. And so I liked seeing that here in this for sure. So we're going to break this thing down and go section by section. So essentially just going to go right off the bat here uh, with the opening. Jo- uh, Joel is building a rock structure, clearly still recovering or dealing or processing with the loss of Tess here. They're 10 miles west of Boston in a forest. They're both, uh, and Ellie is kind of, uh, you know, sitting huddled up by the tree, offers her jacket. Joel says, no, I don't need my jacket back. Um, but then um, Joel cuts off Ellie when she's trying to talk and it's because and Joel thinks Ellie's going to apologize or or say she's sorry. And she's like, no, I'm not saying I'm sorry. No one made you do this. You chose to do this. Her death isn't my fault. And I wrote here, it echoes how some fathers blame their children when the mother dies in childbirth. So I like that they kind of made a little bit of a commentary here. They go on a five hour hike. We're here about Joel's scar in his face. Ellie is turned down for a gun again. We arrive at Cumberland Farms. Ellie talks about playing Mortal Kombat 2 in front of the game. She goes down into this uh, hatch, and we see her grab, I think, are some tampons. I'm not too knowledgeable about this kind of stuff. And then yes, looks John. at... <laughs> yes, John. <laughs> looks, she bought... Yes. It, okay, all right. And then we hear the sounds <laughs> of an infected person there, and she walks up, and she investigates. It takes her knife out, cuts his forehead open, and we see the fungus start to come out. And then in a quick moment, just kills him and stabs him in the brain there, Uh, maybe as a reaction to Tess's death as kind of a little bit of revenge, but also maybe a little bit of fear there. But showing the the strength of Ellie as well, the steel in her spine that she's not afraid of this kind of stuff. And she is willing to kill if necessary. She climbs back up because Joel has finally found his stuff. They have a conversation. They head on out here They and they come upon a wrecked plane. And then Joel and Ellie have a really interesting conversation about how this all started. And kind of, I feel like the show's making a commentary because Ellie's like, was it monkeys? Which we always hear about whenever there's any kind of virus in our world. 
So it undercuts, uh, it completely undercuts that with Joel talking about it, got the food supply and all of this. And this, it just happened kind of overnight. Um, and then we hear about the federal school not teaching her the real story about what happened and how they messed this all up. Then they come upon this graveyard, which Joel was saying was trying to stop Ellie from going towards. But in the graveyard that had, in my opinion, and I may be speaking out of turn here, a little bit of the Holocaust vibe, seeing the skeletons, seeing the, what's left of the clothes, seeing what's left of, of uh, these people who we hear and we find out from Joel that um, the government had grabbed a bunch of people, got them out of the towns, evacuated the small towns, told them they were going to a, uh, a, um, a demilitarized zone, a DZ, but uh, eventually killed them because there, when there wasn't space, they just killed these people just to be safe because they couldn't tell who was infected and who wasn't infected at that time so that's where we stop because we're about to go into the flashback so let's go go back to you to i'll go to shannon on this one shannon your thoughts on this opening here uh for this uh for this show yeah i mean you you see sort of the the beauty of nature in Mm -hmm. this and how you kind of get the idea that eh, maybe the world would be better without people i mean like like Uh it's it's so much more peaceful it's so much more beautiful without people in there you know mucking everything up um (laughs) uh and you know awesome moment for ellie where you know obviously uh, kids in this in this world have to kind of be mature beyond their years they are still kids but her sort of uh rationalizing with them to be like look you were getting something out of this like I, this isn't my fault. Like don't don't punish me for something that's not my fault. Right. And you know you can tell that that strikes a chord with with Joel. And again, just a solid moment. Um, despite not playing the game, uh, I, I did think it was uh, a, a funny nod to the game when he's like, you know, we stash things along the way, mm-hmm. and it's just like, oh, that sort of justifies like if you're you know you're walking along a street and, and the last was oh here's a shotgun, you know <laughs> <laughs> what luck. <laughs> um, but I did like the moment where she goes down. And again, this is a kid who's learning. Like, you know, she's never been out of the QZ. She's, you know, she's seen, you know, the woods for the first time, a lot more bugs than she thought. But that moment where it was almost like dissecting a frog. It's like, mm-hmm. I've got you here. You can't do anything. What does, what does this look like? You see that yeah. curiosity. And yeah, as you said, John, like, I don't know if it was for tests or, or if this is just a, a, you know, over 10 years of just this, you know, rage being built up Good of what her man. life is. And you just see her plunge that knife into the infected skull. Um, I, I, you know, I love the chat that they had, <laughs> like when she said, are Bill and Frank nice? And he said, Frank is. <laughs> and even again, going in so blind, not really knowing, knowing the story and then getting, you know, having everything laid out. It's just really nice. Like I went and watched the episode again this morning. Hmm. And that was one of those lines that is very kind of a throwaway. Yeah. Like, it's just sort of like, oh yeah, he's just talking about this guy. But now having seen their relationship you know who bill is and i'm like oh yeah that's that's fantastically that's just fantastically done and yeah then coming to that uh mass grave site and you know thinking about what their their government did it's yeah. this is tantamount to you know an army retreating and setting their own supplies on fire because it's like if you know we can't take them but we don't want to let them fall into the hands of the enemy Right. Um, And it's a just a grim, grim reminder of what this of what this world is. And so just really, really great setup. Yeah. What a fascinating piece of darkness to start this episode. Right, Mike, before we get into this incredibly glorious and beautiful Mm -hmm. love story, we have this darkness uh, in the beginning here with Tess's death still hanging over both of them, obviously, because it just happened. They're trying to figure out if they can work together. And then we see her confront an infected person. And then we hear about the origins of how this all happened, mm-hmm. which is so simple and scary because it could legitimately happen in our world in that way as well. So what did you think? Of, ending in that graveyard, what did you think of this opening? Well, I like, I mean, I loved, you know, I think we even talked about this last week. Like, it seems yeah. like the show is going down this road of like each week we're going to get sort of a little prologue that's going to be a flashback and it's going to like fill things out in a way that we didn't see in the game. And this week sort of flipped it all on its head. Like Joel and Ellie are the framing device. Like we get them at the beginning and we get them at the end, but the flashback is the entirety of the episode. So it was kind of like an inverse of what we've seen in episodes one and two. 
Um, I was also struck by what Shannon said in the very first shot. I mean, you know, Shannon was talking earlier about how this entire storyline does what Walking Dead sometimes didn't do, which is it gives us hope. It shows us that humanity it can still have beauty. And I think that in the production design of this show, they're also making that choice because, yeah, this world is horrible and this world is scary and this world is harsh, but it is gorgeous. I mean, they are yeah. 10, what, they are 10 miles west of Boston, east of yeah. Boston, whatever. Uh, it's beautiful. Like, it, it, it's, like, breathtakingly beautiful. So, like, it's not just, like, oh, they happen to get a really nice shot. Like, it is intentionally gorgeous. Mm. Um, and with everything with Joel and Ellie, I really love how, again, I didn't play all of the game, but I played enough. And then as, I, as I've been looking at things and reading some things online, like, they do this really wonderful job of weaving in and out of like taking cutscenes from the game and doing them almost word for word, but then adding more or mm. tweaking things to be a little bit different. And even this whole opening scene, like there's stuff that's from the game, but the part where Ellie kind of stands up to Joel and says, I wasn't going to apologize. That's, yeah. this is not my fault. That's new. Um, and I think they're doing a really interesting thing with Ellie that plays a lot through all of this opening sequence, which is I love that they are allowed that she is tough mm -hmm. and she is assertive and she is clearly someone who's grown up in this world. And she's also clearly a kid. Yeah. Like it would be so easy to do a story where either I'm a hardened, I'm a hardened person in this world has made me hard and I've lost all vestiges of childhood or I am just this innocent child who needs to be protected. And she gets to play both, mm -hmm. which is really, really great. Um, So we get to see, uh, the thrill and wonder that she has about an airplane or how fascinating she finds nature and she gets to, or, or how excited she is about Mortal Kombat 2 um, and how, how, how into that she is. But then we get to see her look at this adult and be like, I'm not the one that killed your friend. Mm -hmm. And when she does go down into the cellar, she's not an idiot. Like she, cause like, I was like, she, she opened that thing and it was dark and I grabbed my friend Tony and I'm like, don't go in there. Like, I was like, I was like, nope. But like, she shined her light down there. She dropped yeah. in, she picked up that garbage can. She set up her exit. Like she handled it smart. Um, and then I think, yeah, I think examining, um, the infected, it was really interesting because I think it's a little bit of everything that you guys said. Mm -hmm. I think that if you grew up in this world, you would be fascinated by these boogeymen that you heard about and maybe never saw. And yeah. I think that you would want to sort of examine it. And especially if you're her and she is somehow immune to some of this and she doesn't know why, there's probably extra fascination. But also, this thing is the reason that your life sucks. I mean, like a year and a half ago, if any of us could have gone and stabbed COVID in the eye, we certainly <laughs> would have done it. So, you know, I think that there's so much. And then we talk a lot, Shannon talks a lot about this. We all talk about this, about exposition and how to make it feel natural. And them walking along and her very naturally wanting to know about how this happened just allows Joel to sort of just lay out in like stuff that we've hinted at and kind of talked about, but this is exactly how it went down. And this is how fast it happened. Um, and then, yeah, getting to that mass grave. I know, John, you were saying you thought it was because they didn't know who was infected and who wasn't. But I think it's actually worse than that. They knew all those people weren't infected, but they also knew that they couldn't protect everybody in these Great small voice. towns. Yeah. So they, they didn't say, oh, maybe some of you are sick and maybe you aren't. They knew that these people were okay at the time, but yeah. they still represented a threat because if you can't protect everybody, these people, one, one infected person gets into this town that the government doesn't have the bandwidth to protect, and all of a sudden you have an army of infected, oh, wow, wouldn't it be easier to just kill all these people and dump them in a grave? Yeah. So it represents something that's actually even more uh, just cold and clinical yeah. and scary. Um, so yeah, like, so even before we get to the meat of this episode, which obviously we all have a lot to talk about, they just did so much exposition and character stuff. And I thought it was just really all lovely and well done. Yeah, yeah, I agree with that as well. And I, and I agree with you. The exposition was done naturally. And it's the third episode. We're not getting it in the first episode. It's the third episode. We've spent time with Ellie and Joel now. Tess is out of the way, unfortunately, because she passed in the last episode. So they have no choice but to talk to each other, right? right. And so 
Joel isn't going to give up too much, but this basic stuff he will give up just because he's got a natural inclination to protect, but also to dole out information only when he deems it appropriate or it's necessary, right? Other stuff about himself, as he says at the end of the episode, let's keep our stories to ourselves. He's not ready yet to open up an Ellie to Ellie and give her more, give himself more of, uh, give her more of himself. And this is more basic stuff as you would to a, a teenager explain yeah. the world for, uh, cause she's asking so many damn questions anyway, which he makes a comment on, which I think is great as well. <laughs> and you're right, Shannon, to point out the Joel, uh, the, um, <clears throat> the bill thing, because later on when he gets the letter and he reads it and he goes, Joel, I was never, I never really liked you, but I understood you and we were fine. So clearly that, that relationship from the, from what we're going to see, we're going to talk about here at the table with the gun pointed at Joel by bill that stays the relationship going forward. <laughs> For the rest of their interaction so very interesting stuff all right let's take a quick break and we'll jump into the meat of the episode as michael just said right after this that's good is that is that the song <laughs> that's the song all right <clears throat> let's get it going we go to the flashback here september 30 2003 i'm not gonna spend too much time i'm just gonna hit all the beats <clears throat> We see soldiers being put on trucks. Uh, a man is watching it all on multiple cameras. This is Bill. He says, not today, you new world order jackboot Fs. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have <laughs> thought that in, in different iterations. He comes up into his house. We see that he's alone, and we see this montage of him essentially uh, uh, taking care of himself, turning on the gas, going get Home Depot stuff, basically becoming a self-sufficient person. He's eating when an alarm goes off and an infected person has shot one of his traps. But then we cut to four years later. He has a gate set up here. An alarm goes off, heads out into the to look at this pit. And inside is Frank. And he says, I'm not infected. They have an exchange about where he's from and how he got here. For, uh, Bill uh, gets him out and then says, you can go. Frank doesn't want to go, says he's hungry. So he, Bill lets him in, lets him shower, makes some food, serves him, and pairs rabbit with Beaujolais. Let me tell you something. Nothing makes me feel more like a straight man, like not understanding how to pair wine with food. I'll tell you that right now. Okay, they, they, finish. <laughs> they finish, but Frank wants to play a song on his piano. They start to play Long, Long Time from Linda Ronstadt. Uh, uh, Bill stops him and takes over, and then uh, he's, Bill. Uh, Frank asks Bill who, you, uh, who you're singing this for, what girl, and of course he says, no girl, and Bill, and Frank says, yeah, I knew that. Then they they have this wonderful kiss here. They end up in bed. It's a really sweet, tender moment there between them. He's saying, I'm going to take it slow. If you've never done this before, I'm going to take it slow. So very sweet stuff. Then we cut to three years later. They're fighting with each other. It's all because Frank wants to decorate the place. He wants to bring friends in. He wants to clean up the town a little bit because Bill just wants to kind of hide out in his bunker and protect his own and not mess with anything else here. Then we cut to them having dinner with uh, Tess and Joel here. And as I said, Joel has or Bill has the gun on Joel. Tess and Frank are clearly getting along. They pitch an arrangement here. They come up with some danger codes. We hear about the 80s danger codes. Um, then Joel tells Bill that, listen, I can help you. You need that fence is going to go down in a year. You need all this kind of stuff. Uh, the the Fedra is not going to come after you. Uh, and you're going to ward off the infected, but people will come a, at night in, in, in quiet. We cut to three years later. Bill and Frank are jogging. Frank shows Bill his garden. They're growing strawberries. They share a beautiful one with the strawberries. Um, Bill apologizes for getting old faster than him. It's a beautiful moment. I was never afraid before you showed up. Ugh, that's such a great line. We cut to a rainy night. These Raiders blow. Uh, these Raiders come. They get killed by uh, Bill's fence. But Bill gets shot. Frank takes care of Bill. Then we cut to some time later, and we clearly see that uh, Frank is sick. Um, he's in a wheelchair. They're much older now. Frank is painting. Bill's taking care of him. Uh, and then we get to this uh, scene where Bill tells Frank that, or Frank tells Bill rather, this is my last day, uh, which of course devastates Bill. But they go through these beautiful moments together uh, from the couch on this montage. They get married. He makes him food, which reminds you of the first time they met, the dinner and the wine. They're even having the same wine. Crushes up the uh, the uh, pills there to essentially uh, kill um, Frank. And uh, Bill takes a drink as well. They head upstairs and we go to Black Frame, which in essence implies that they implies that they both uh, died. Even though Frank initially would have resisted it, he he appreciates the romantic nature of it. Michael, please take it away um, about this whole meat of the episode here between Bill and Frank. Well, I mean, it's it, it's all just so well done. Also, 
casting Ron Swanson as Bill is just the most brilliant thing that you I could mean. possibly do <laughs> in the history. Like it is, it is brilliant. But like the whole opening, I was just laughing because all I could think of the whole opening with him, with Bill, like in his bunker. He's been preparing for this. He's got his guns. Oh, he yeah. doesn't trust the government. <laughs> He's a conspiracy guy. And all I could think of is that there are some poor, poor, poor people right now, poor right wing uh, conservatives watching this show going, now this is what I want. This is a representation of me. And I was like, ooh, these guys are going to have some real hard things to do with in about 10, 15 minutes. <laughs> but, uh, but it was great. I mean, and, and also I, I will say that like I loved seeing I, – I love seeing a portrayal of a queer person who wasn't a liberal, uh, mm. progressive, grew up in – like, uh, like, like Bill is such an interesting character because yeah. he does represent these two extremes. He was a survivalist. He didn't trust the government. He was a conspiracy guy. He was prepared for all the shit to come down. He thought 9-11 was an inside job. Like he right. was this very, very different person to what most people on the left would uh would, would think of. Um, and then watching him sort of go through the go through his plan. Like he, you know, the 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 soldiers left, he was on his own, and he went through it, and it was methodical and it was smart and it was great and so just seeing all that and then when he's having dinner by himself i have to believe that this was straight up somebody was like hey we love parks and rec because he's literally doing the ron swanson birthday dinner <laughs> like every year on parks and rec ron swanson got to be alone in his chair eating a steak and watching Bridge on the River Kwai, and Bill is sitting alone in his chair, eating his steak, watching Infected get fried on his fence, and just going, that's nice. And I'm like, that's Ron Swanson. It's Ron Swanson. He says um, it never gets old, which is a great never gets old. It never gets old. <laughs> um, the minute that Frank shows up, it's so wonderful. Like, this is a guy that can't even lie. He's like, are you armed? Yeah. There's like that big pause, and he's like, no, wait, why, why did you pause? Uh, I was trying to... Think of a reason why I should pretend it. I, I don't know. And then, like, I think as an audience, even if you know nothing about anything, you watch this game. The second that Frank corrects Bill about Arby's. Yeah. It's like, he's like, you don't get a free meal, <laughs> meal here. This isn't Arby's. And he's like, eh, Arby's didn't give you a free meal. It was a restaurant. Um, it's just all really kind of in the midst of in the midst of this, like, show about infected and this survivalist and everything that's going on. You're automatically put on edge if you don't know anything because... You expect, like Shannon said, we've all watched Walking Dead. We've watched the shows where you don't trust anybody and someone pretends to be nice, but then they really turn their back on you. So you're a little bit on edge, but Frank is just chipping away at that to the audience and to Bill because you're like, hey, he seems nice. I kind of want to trust him. And then the entire meal, it's just really nice because Bill is this, he's so awkward, but he, and this is where I think um, you just like, like it just all the credit um, to the performances to the for, from both of these guys, but yeah. Bill as a character playing someone who is gay but has never really admitted that or dealt with it, and yeah. you are watching him struggle with that in real time. So like when Frank is in the shower and he brings the clothes in and he just stands there awkwardly because there is a attractive naked man in the shower, but he's all uh, 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 like he just had he he ends up. This guy who we saw as this badass survivalist looks like a scared little boy. Mm. And that is so beautiful. And then leading up to like the playing of the piano and the Linda Ronstadt song and the way that Bill plays it versus Frank and that Frank understands it. And then the entire time, like Frank sort of taking charge and taking Bill upstairs and even like Bill taking a shower where the, well, there is still like a stranger in his room shows this level of sort of like trust. Uh, and the whole thing, like just the entire thing was beautiful. And from that point on, like the audience, you're, you're just fucked as an audience member because like everything from that point on is just the beauty of all of it. Like their fight as a couple. Oh yeah. And the fight, the fight is great because when he is like, you think all the government are Nazis and he's like, the government are Nazis. He's like, well, they are now like everything <laughs> about their fight is so great. And it represents, again, the entire episode is what Shannon said, is that Bill was all about surviving in the worst possible climate imaginable. Yeah. And Frank is like, that's not enough. Like, we need to live. 
And and then that, you know, and that brings in Joel and Tess. And then you see that like there's just the parallels between the two of them as these couples and that Joel and Bill sort of size each other up and get each other. But it all sort of makes sense. The strawberry moment is just it, it's this unexpected moment of beauty. And again, I think that's what this show is doing so well. It's giving us all the scares and the horror, but it's giving us these moments of like, this is what we're fighting for. This is why things are worth living. Um, and then they just pull a fast one on you because once we're off the reservation of the game doesn't do any of this, we don't really know what's going to happen. So when all of the invaders do attack and we get to see just how effective all of the stuff that Bill did uh, to protect them really is, it really looks like Bill's going down. You're like, oh, well, yeah, so is yeah. Bill going to die? And then Frank is there. Like, we don't really know what's going to happen. And then they switch. So you're like, okay, Bill's going to die. Then they flip it on you again. And you see that Frank is really old and Frank is sick. And then the moment that Frank is like, yeah. this is my last day, it is like, okay, well, I'm I'm, I'm just done. Like, I was just a sobbing mess for the rest of it. I had to go back and watch that stuff twice for this review. because I was, And I was mad that I had to. Because I was like, man, don't make me do this. I, I can't. I don't have it in me. Um, and yeah, it's just like the it. It was just so unexpectedly beautiful. Uh, it was. It was hard. It was hard. It was hard to process at the end. Like the end, I was just a puddle on the floor. Yeah. Uh, all right, Shannon, your thoughts on this one uh, on this meat of the episode here, the relationship between Bill and Frank, fleshing out much more than what we got in the uh, in the game between these two. Uh, I'm gonna try to keep my shit bottled up. Uh, yeah, but easy. <laughs> be forewarned, as you were just going through the recap, I'm like, ah, here it comes. <laughs> um, yeah, to uh, Vogel's point about the casting of Nick Offerman, look, man, he he's he's people don't know that before Parks and Rec, he wasn't really a comedy guy. Like he he, right. he was a dramatic. He's a dramatically trained actor. So to see him come into this role and play it so straight. You know, not not really, um, but, but be able to add those little bits of comedy that he fine tuned over seven years in Parks and Rec was just so much fun. And there's nothing more cathartic to me than watching Nick Offerman enjoy a steak. I mean, it's just like just the way he cuts it like you. I mean, Vogel was right. I mean, this guy did everything correctly. And then flash forward, what, four years, and you yeah. see what he has been able to do in that moment that he meets Murray Bartlett. And again, I, I figured I didn't know these two were going to be were going to be partners. I didn't know it was going to be a romantic relationship or just a friendship. Um, but the moment that Murray Bartlett shows up, because as Vogel said, we've been so conditioned <laughs> to not trust anyone the whole time they're eating. I'm like. Oh my God! Is this is this when it happens? Is this when Murray Bartlett takes a swing at him? <laughs> um, but the moment that, like, I love the fact that inside that house, I mean, this is this is a lot of my head canon. I'm like, that yeah. is Bill's mom's house that yeah. he oh, has not sure changed at all. 100%. Everything that he did is beneath the surface. It's in that bunker. It's in the fence. And so as Murray Bartlett is going over there looking at that piano. And he's already, you know, made the comment about pairing Beaujolais with Rabbit. Um, and then he sees the the pieces of music. And when he says, no, this is yours, pointing out Linda Ronstadt. And <laughs> Bill, even though he's this tough survivalist, he can't listen to someone butcher that song. <laughs> <laughs> I thought was just so beautiful. And, and you know, probably pr prior to 2003, he probably never came out of the closet. I oh, mean, clearly. this is something no. that he kept yeah. he kept bottled up this whole time. And you see with with uh, Frank, um, he's a people person. And in this world of surviving, it's the people people that are going to bring things back because uh, you see the way he talks about tests. He's like, you know, we need to have friends. We need to do this. We need to have people over. And even though there is a lot not to trust in the world, as Joel points out, um, trust is what bring trust is what will bring civilization back. If everyone's out for themselves, mm -hmm. it's never it's never going to work. And I love the conversation between uh, Joel and Bill. I oh, thought yeah. that was so awesome. And how Pedro Pascal is 100% on Bill's side. He's like, yeah, 
<laughs> I understand. I'm right there with you and we can help you and get that gun out of my face. <laughs> the, 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 the transition of that line yeah. was so great. And then watching as they get older together, the whole strawberry moment, even though Frank is all about living, he still grew those strawberries. Don't lay on my strawberries. <laughs> I thought that was such a great moment. And when you see what the fence can actually do, I mean, the whole reason of like the, 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 the buzzsaw is to create a spark that this gas will then fry people like, Oh my gosh. And you like more than likely bill has taught Frank how to use a gun. Like he, he, he has fine tuned his abilities, but that's not what Frank, whew, that's not what Frank is thinking about. Frank is thinking I have to go get, I got to go get, whew, I got to go get Bill. <laughs> it was just so, so well done. And seeing, ooh, ooh, <laughs> yeah. seeing how they grew old and uh, sorry guys. <laughs> All right. uh, I will. Uh, I will. I will give Shannon a break. I'll, I'll right give Shannon a, a break here to get under control. I, it, I will say like one thing that occurred to me as he is talking about where they're about to get to, and it occurred to a lot of people. I saw a lot of people on Twitter saying yeah. this, but like, yeah, I think Shannon is a hundred percent correct that that is Bill's mom's house. Bill grew yeah. up there. Bill never left there. He never had a relationship that would require him to leave there. His mom passed away. He got the house. Um, but also though, that timeline wise, gay marriage is not legal. <laughs> In the world, all oh, right, two thousand three. Yeah, good point. So yeah. even if he had come out of the closet, which he right. did not, the idea of even legally marrying someone. So the fact that like they kind of lived their lives together, living their thing, and then on the last day of the two of them together, uh, they're like, "Let's get married." Yeah, and that they like like to. There's something about uh having the best thing in your life and the worst thing in your life happen at the exact same on the exact same day that like yeah. it wasn't like oh remember when we got married let's look at our album like they spent that day together getting married um having the exact same meal that they had on the day that they mm -hmm. met like it was just such a beautiful uh microcosm of all the things that were worth it and and you know and that's kind of what bill says like that that it's all like he was his life he said like what the words he says to him to, to frank at the end he goes i'm satisfied yeah like and i don't think that bill ever was satisfied and mm -hmm. there's something so strange about somebody like you know joel is somebody as a character who was living a life but like had a daughter he like the, joel had a life that he lost right. and so joel is dealing with all of the loss during all of this but to have a character like bill who was ready to survive, but didn't really have anything to survive for. And then in the worst possible time, found this thing that made everything worth it. Yeah. Like that, that, that's what really got me. Yeah. You okay, absolutely. Shannon? You ready? You ready? You, you ready? Your thing, Shannon, or... you ready? You ready to wrap up, Shannon? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Uh, okay. <laughs> Here's what I'll say. I thought it was beautiful. It was gorgeous. Um, I was so caught up in this relationship Murray Bartlett deserves just as much love as Nick Offerman for what he brought to Frank. And I'm not a White Lotus person, so I have very little uh, exposure to Murray Bartlett. And he was incredible here. So this episode might make me go back and try White Lotus wow. again uh, because I quit after the first episode. Really was annoyed after the first episode. But Ooh. seeing seeing what he brought, it's okay. It's okay to have a different opinion. Seeing what he brought to the <laughs> role here. I thought was incredible. The chemistry worked really well. Um, the conversations they both had after in the uh, post um, post show documentary they do a little five minute documentary they do. I thought really encapsulated in the understanding they had for this relationship. That being said, this needs to happen more, and I loved it. I lo as a straight guy watching a gay romance play out, this is natural. This is normal. This needs to happen on all kinds of fronts so we can get rid of the stigma of it. And it's and people stop saying shove down. We have so many heterosexual love stories in all of these fucking shows, even the post-apocalyptic shows, even more so in the post-apocalyptic shows. It's nice to have something like this as a change of pace. It was well written, well directed, well acted. It was paced out perfectly. The time jumps made so much sense where you were able to go along with the changes in the relationship. And I'm telling you, that scene by the garden, that scene is me the, by the strawberries with 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 Lindley it is that idea of I didn't care about anybody else 
I wasn't afraid until you came along. And that's the truth. You know, I, uh, the other day I just kind of was alone crying, thinking about what happens if she passes before I do, how am I going to function in the world now that I've become so accustomed to having her by my side to deal with everything. So it was so real in how it showed you love. And I think Neil Druckmann said that really well in the post show yeah. doc as well, where he said, this is the different ways that you show love. And look, Frank was an idiot to run out there. Bill was handling it. Bill was handling it. But that's love sometimes. Frank ran out because he loves Bill. He wanted to take Bill from danger. But it was Bill turning around to tell Frank to get back in the house. They got him shot in the stomach. So those are those things that happen with love. There's a, things happen. Those are the sacrifices. That's part of it. It's not all rosy. And even Bill or Frank saying to Bill, I had some really bad days. And yes, some bad days with you. Just those are honest shit that was going on. I loved that. And so we got so by the time we got to the after the couch and we got to that beautiful montage of them spending the day together, I was so just in love with this these two as a couple that when yeah. Frank made the decision that he made, I'm sorry, and then Bill made the decision that he made. It was Bill's decision that broke me. Offerman saying like, you know, I, I like you just said, Michael. You know, I, I didn't. I just, uh, you know, I'm satisfied. There's not much more to. And you know what? That's that makes so much sense well, to me. A survivalist and a guy who enjoys the world, both making their own decisions about their lives. You know, um, there's there's just operating underneath this whole episode are points of views about some hot button issues in our world. How the idea of this stuff can of a virus can spread spreading the conspiracy theories that go along with that. A guy who has conspiracy theories about the government and all this kind of stuff. And then here, this idea of whether you're allowed to take your own life or not, which is always mm -hmm. a big battle in the world as well. I thought all of it was handled so perfectly, so deftly, so honestly, that this is just one of the greatest, greatest episodes of television we've ever seen. You know? so. Well, and I think on the, on the subject of representation, yeah. I do think one thing that's important to point out is I think a lot of times when we talk about representation, particularly the queer representation, it's like, well, yeah. queer people should see themselves represented as well. Which is true. Like that's Absolutely. it is a hundred percent true. Like we all want to see ourselves represented on screen, and certain groups are represented have have classically been represented more often than others. But I think Correct. the other thing is, and I think the bigger thing to think about is, as my two crybaby co-hosts here are, you know are showing, are <laughs> no, it's a good thing. Um, I would prefer emotional. Go ahead. Yes, a great relationship is a great relationship. Yeah, I I I I will cry my face off. Uh, when I watch a bunch of movies that we've all grown up watching with straight relationships because I completely fall in love with those people as a couple. And this queer couple, it's not like this is just for queer people to enjoy. This right. is such a well-done relationship, period. It doesn't matter. Like, the yeah. details of it are a little bit different because it's two guys. Um, but this relationship of these two humans mm -hmm. coming together, as different as they are, and falling in love and giving each people giving each other a reason to live, it affects everybody. It's not a oh well that was great that was great for the LGBTQ community. It's right. great for everybody. We all yeah. see ourselves reflected in this. John sees him and Lindley. Shannon sees him and Shaney. I see me and somebody who uh, maybe uh, <laughs> I'm gonna meet at some point. I don't well now I just depressed myself so I have to go. But <laughs> your, your um, bill is out there. Your bill is out. There. <laughs> Um, yeah, so I, I that, so I think it's like it, it shows that a really well done relationship is universal, which I think is yeah. also really important. Agreed, agreed. Anything more to say on this before we jump into the next section, the last section of the show? Um, I will say yep. that I I also enjoyed the fact that uh, Frank underscored the reason that I will survive in the pandemic because I cannot shoot and I cannot build a generator nor a battery and I will probably not be handy with a weapon, but I will be the really nice guy that plants flowers and makes friends. <laughs> so I am very excited that I have a role in the coming apocalypse. Yes, yes. You will paint all the shops. Absolutely. <laughs> okay. Let's take a quick break and we'll be right back right after this. That's good. All right, let's get into the ending here. Uh, would Joel and Ellie show up at the at uh, Bill and Frank's place? Um, and I just wrote, "Fuck, he's gonna find them." Uh, Ellie finds a letter and a key addressed to Joel. Ellie reads the letter. Uh, Joel goes to try to open the bedroom upstairs, but it's locked. 
Um, and then we come downstairs. As I said, Ellie has the letter. She reads the letter. And it's a great explanation of the men that Joel and Bill are. You know, the people, rather, I should say, regardless of gender, that Joel and Bill are. They're the protectors. And Bill, in a way, giving one final gift to Joel or one final exchange to Joel. Hey, th- you're going to get all my stuff. But here is something you need to understand about who you are as a person and reminds him that he's a protector here. Uh, Ellie gets to the test part and stops reading. Joel takes the letter, the letter and walks outside. And listen, I know we've been praising Murray Bartlett and Nick Offerman, and rightfully so, but Pedro Pascal does a fantastic job in this episode. In the first section, talking to Ellie and all the stuff he's dealing with with Tess, and in this moment, when he walks out, he doesn't break down. He doesn't go crazy. He just lets the emotion of the loss of Tess wash over him, but he needs to be outside of the house so he can do it in private. And I thought that was brilliant. Then he keeps it together because he needs to, because he's hardened from 20 years of pain and hardship in this world, and then uses the key, goes and sees what Bill has left for him. Uh, he walks back in and offers to, of, to Ellie and makes an offer to Ellie to come with him to go find Tommy, but she's got to follow his three rules. Um, don't bring up Tess. Don't question me uh, and do what I say. She agrees. They grab what they can. They shower, and then Ellie goes snooping, finds a gun, puts it in her backpack, they get in the truck, and Ellie is enamored with a car. She's never been in a car, just like when she was looking at a plane and going, you were in the sky. He puts her seatbelt on, which is a really sweet kind of moment of taking care of her. They take off. Ellie puts on a cassette. It's Linda Ronstadt's version of the song from earlier. So, Shannon, uh, what do you think about this ending for this particular episode? I mean, as as you wrote in your notes, I was like, oh, no, he's going to find him. Mm. But then the fact that, you know, Bill locked the door left the window open because dead bodies decompose yeah. <laughs> and how we put that. I love that it said to Joel or whoever he's like, this is probably Joel. Cause otherwise you would have been killed. On the fence. <laughs> like, or, or you would have, you know, uh, fall, you know, fallen victim to one of my traps. He, 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 like there are yeah, a couple of great funny. Nick Offerman moments. Like when he tries a strawberry and he has this gleeful laugh that apparently is the laugh of Nick off. That is actually how he laughs. And as <laughs> like the he, 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 like you can hear it in your head. Yeah, I like the fact that uh, it was sort of a uh, game recognizing game. Like mm-hmm. Bill's just like, you know what? I I didn't really like you, but I respected you. Uh, I I understood you. So I guess that makes us friends. <laughs> like that's such a great way for you know. It's just such a great way to encapsulate that relationship. Um, and you when you think about the changes that they made from the game, because again, I read about it afterwards. Yeah. Um. The the. As far as I understand, the the point of uh, Joel and Ellie meeting up with Bill is so they can get more stuff. Right. So, but as they're going through and they see where where uh, it what has happened to Frank in the game, um, that it it is a change. And the fact that they gave them kind of a happy ending, like I was like, oh my gosh, that's what happened. What needed to happen in the game happened. Like right. Joel yeah. and Ellie got to restock all of their, you know, all your ammunition, all your supplies but you got, it was just done in a different way. So it doesn't betray the game. Like it gives us this other story that was just so well done. Um, And watching how Ellie is like fascinated with firearms. Um, But as you said, John, that moment where as he's reading, like use use these to protect Tess. And Joel knows Mm -hmm. he's already failed at that. And how can he protect Tess? He can protect her by doing the last thing that she asked him to do. Yeah. was to take care of this kid. It's just so, so well done. Um, yeah, and then watching the coming, you know, the the preview for next week's episode is filling me with dread already. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah. But yeah, everything in this, everything in the conclusion of this episode, everything leading up to it was just fantastic. And some people pointed out how the episode pulls back and we see the curtain billowing uh, there through the window of Bill and Frank's place that that mirrors what the homepage is in The Last of Us Part 2. So we don't know what that means or what that might be inferring, but very interesting. And also, as we saw, I mean, the Linda Ronstadt song plays for Bill and Frank, and we know how Bill and Frank end up. The Linda Ronstadt playing at the end with Joel and Ellie makes me worried about where Joel and Ellie are going to end up in this series. Michael, your thoughts uh, about the end of this uh, particular uh, episode? I think Shannon hit on a lot of it, but I think that, um, you know, starting the shot with the close on the flowers that are dead. Yes. And then Joel nice. and then Joel sees those flowers and automatically knows like what's interesting. He walks into the house and he's at, he asks he's he's asking for Bill. He's calling out for Bill because his automatic assumption is Frank is dead. Yes. 
Bill's not going to take care of the flowers, so he must, I mean, Frank's not, yeah, yeah, Frank, Frank's the one that would have done the flowers, so I think just an understanding of who these two guys are as he goes in, and then, yeah, just the, um, everything about the letter and the way this is all handled, it's, to the point of the changes from the game, and I know there's people are like, well, this 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 inherently changes the vibe of Bill and Frank, and like it's that in the game it's more tragic, and this is a world of tragedy. But like, all the pieces are there. To to Shannon's point, like Joel and Ellie come to a place where a survivalist has set a bunch of traps, and there is a Bill, there is a Frank, there is a death, there is a letter, and they yeah. get to get a bunch of supplies. All the boxes are checked. The fact yeah. that those boxes have been reordered to tell a much more subtle, nuanced, and uh, emotionally fulfilling story, I think is great. It's what they said in the closing, in the post credit sort of uh, behind the scenes thing. They say, when we're looking at deviating from the game, if it's going to be the same or a negative, we don't. We stick with the game. Right. But if it's going to be a positive, if we're going to make a stronger, more powerful, more interesting story, we're going to do it. And they did. Um, and so even the letter which has a lot of the same elements uh even like when bill says to joel i never really liked you you're yeah. uh, you're you know like uh that is actually pulled from the letter in the game but contextually yeah. given who wrote the letter and who the letter is to is just very different so they kept a lot of those elements but made them a lot more powerful and then yeah when ellie is reading that letter out loud and gets to the word test and has to stop mm -hmm. I thought I was done crying and then I wasn't. So I cried some more. So that was great. And I completely agree. Like when Pedro Pascal goes outside and has that moment alone, so powerful. Um, I love that Ellie gets the t-shirt that she wears in the game. Um, <laughs> and then I also loved the detail of, I was wondering as they were resupplying, they pulled all those boxes out and there was like boxes for like women's clothes, this clothes, that clothes. And I was like, why the fuck would they have clothes for all these different people? And then I realized that Frank probably did that so that if strangers did wander in who needed help, he would have clothes for them at the ready. And I oh, got upset again point. and I got emotional again because Bill uh, wouldn't do that. He wouldn't have thought to do it. But Frank would have been like, you know, I'm going to collect all these clothes and I'm going to keep them. So if we do meet people and they need to be resupplied or they need this. And then I was like, oh, Frank, you're so <laughs> great. It, it just it was upsetting all over again. Um, and yeah, just in general, uh, oh, the one more detail that I loved is, and this is different from the game too. In the game, Ellie knows how to drive a car. Oh, and yeah. in the show, Ellie is as amazed by a car as she is uh, with um, an airplane. And just the the wonderment that she had, like this is like a spaceship. Again, it's a small change, but I think it's a really great change that makes us love Ellie more, which is probably going to be tragic for all of us in the long run. Yeah, probably. Uh, let's wrap up here. Uh, final thoughts is we got like five minutes left in this one. Uh, Shannon, your final thoughts on the, on this episode. I mean, the show continues to just hit home run after home run. Um, I, 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 I don't want to say they have nowhere to go but down at this point because everything has just been so good. Um, but this definitely seems like uh, this is going to be the first uh, video game property that will probably be up for some shiny statues. Oh, yeah. I think Emmy. Oh, yeah. this, I, I tweeted that this is the episode that would win them the Emmy for the series if they do win one. But certainly Nick Offer and Murray Bartlett should be nominated. Mike, your thoughts, final thoughts on this episode. So. Um, it, well, it's exactly kind of what you said earlier on. Uh, now, every time that uh, a Marvel movie or a Star Wars movie or any other big franchise has two characters kissing in the background for 0.3 seconds and says, hey, look at how much representation we have, we can all point to this episode and say, shut the fuck up. <laughs> because <laughs> this is how this is how you do it correctly. Please see what Last of Us did and don't be stupid anymore. Um, yeah. And then in addition to that, I think what the show is doing, even whether when it deviates or when it doesn't, why Last of Us is such a beloved game is because it packs an emotional punch in between all of the great gameplay and fighting and collecting of things and all of the fun stuff that Last of Us gives you as a game. The reason people love it is because it is a intensely emotional story. So the yeah. fact that they are finding the ways to take that emotional story directly to the series and in the ways that they're deviating and creating even a more powerful emotional story is, like Shannon said, why this is probably the preeminent video game adaptation that we have out there uh, and one that is going to win a ton of awards. 
Yeah, I think once again, much credit to Craig Mazin and, and Neil Druckmann for finding a way to weave elements of the game mixed in with uh, a new approach to telling that story for this medium. It is working incredibly well, so much so that I've already ordered Last of Us Part 1 for the PS5 because I'm like, I've got to play this game now. And then I didn't think I was going to play this game. Now I really need to play this game in this episode, even though it deviated from the game play necessarily just cements the love that you feel that people have for this franchise uh and including craig mason and neil Druckmann and everybody involved in this one so fantastic fantastic this is one of those seminal episodes you know it when you see it this is one of those seminal episodes of television that people are going to refer to all the time this rivals law their lost episode the constant for me it really does which i never thought anything would come close to that and it did that for sure. All right, let's wrap it up there. Thank you all so much for watching this uh, spoiler review of ep episode of uh, episode three of The Last of Us. Shannon, what do we have to tell them? Yeah, if you'd like to follow us on social media, on Twitter, it's at geek underscore buddies, on Instagram at the underscore geek underscore buddies. If you'd like to follow me on social media, where well, you can't see when I'm getting emotional, it's at Shannon underscore McClung at Twitter, at Shannon underscore, or at Shannon the Geek Buddy on Instagram. If you'd like to follow Mr. Vogel, it is at MK Tune. If you would like to follow Mr. Roca, it is at the Roca Says. Mucky. If you like hot, salty man tears, here's what you can do to make sure that we keep giving them to you. Uh, you can hit that like button below. Uh, you can subscribe to Johnny's Outlaw Nation page. Leave your comments below. What did you think of the game? Uh, what do you think of this episode? How do you think it stacks up, stacks up to the game? What are you excited about? What are you scared about? Um, as always, if you have played the game, don't spoil things too much for other people in the comments. If you are listening to us on a podcast, go ahead and leave us uh, some stars, leave us some comments. Helps us go up in the rankings. And as always, the best thing that you can do is retweet this video, post it to your socials, send it to your friends, and tell them to hang out with your buddies, the Geek Buddies. There you go. And once again, big shout out to Carbon Health who continues to power and sponsor us here on the Geek Buddies. Head over to CarbonHealth.com to go get checked out today or download the app to have a doc in your pock. All right, take care of yourselves, everybody. Go recover, go rest, go, go wipe those tears, and we'll talk to you next time with another brand new episode of the Geek Buddies! <laughs> <laughs>